Okay, gonna get us started now. Hello and welcome to Let's Chat About, the free monthly webinar series hosted by Hope and Focus. We've developed this series with those living with LCA and IRDs in mind, but it is open to anyone who is interested in what's happening in our communities. My name is Courtney Coates, and I'm the Director of Outreach and Development for Hope and Focus. Before we get started, I just want to take a moment to thank our sponsors for this series, AGTC, Dominion Energy, Janssen, Mira GTX, and Spark Therapeutics. We could not provide programs such as these without their support. A few housekeeping items. The session will last about 30 to 45 minutes. Your microphones have been muted and your cameras are off. You can submit questions through the Q&A function, and as time allows, we'll take any questions that come in live. We are recording this session, and after the webinar, we will post the recording to our YouTube channel, and we will send out the link. It is my pleasure today to welcome Carmen Trupek, Senior Director of Scientific Programs at RareX, a position that enables her to bring together her passion for supporting rare disease communities and her experiences with academia, telemedicine, advocacy and industry. Carmen has a long background and interest in inherited retinal diseases and previously worked at the KCI Institute in Portland, Oregon, providing counseling and education to patients and families with inherited eye diseases and coordinating clinical and molecular research. She developed the first nationwide telemedicine program for ocular genetic counseling and genetic testing at Informed DNA and co-developed both pharma and advocacy-sponsored genetic testing programs as a consultant to Spark Therapeutics and the Foundation Fighting Blindness. She also spent more than 10 years serving on the board of directors for the Usher Syndrome Coalition and the Hear See Hope Foundation. At RareX, Carmen drives collaborative programming and partnerships to maximize the RareX data platform for the advancement of patient-driven research and industry-supported therapeutic pipes. Lines. Thank you for joining us today, Carmen. Thank you, Courtney. Thanks. Um, so just to get us started, um, can you tell us a little bit about RareX and how the company was founded? Sure. So um, RareX was actually founded by the same um, founder of Global Genes. So uh, Nicole Boyce, who founded both organizations, had been at Global Genes for over 10 years. Global Genes is a an organization that provides um, support for patients, families, and patient advocacy groups um, dedicated to rare diseases. So um, over the more than 10 years at Global Genes, what she and others had come to recognize is that there was a tremendous need to solve problems in um, data, in data collection and data sharing for patients and patient communities uh, affected by rare diseases. So, you know, what, what often happens with um, rare disease patient data is that um, either data is collected somewhere, but it sits, you know, privately kind of in a silo. Um, so maybe that's a natural history study that's done at a particular academic institution, but other researchers can't access that data, um, or maybe the data is being actively collected by the patient community, but it's kind of a series of surveys that particular researchers want, and that data is really valuable to that particular researcher, but it's not generalizable and useful to lots of different research studies, or the data doesn't exist at all, right? So there are a lot of very rare diseases where like they just don't have hardly any data. So RareX was really started to address all these data problems. Um, so RareX has a platform, a data collection platform that enables rare disease communities, like even ultra rare, very small communities to begin to collect data um, and to do that in a highly, highly structured and streamlined way that exists, that, that, that aligns to existing research ontologies. Um, ontologies meaning sort of like naming conventions and categories. So we work very hard at RareX to make sure that 
every single question that gets asked of patients and families is a true data point, right? It's a research data point. Um, so, so that's the way that we collect data, but then we also kind of the other, the, the other side of that is, is that we um, share that data. So with patient permission, all of the data that's collected on the platform gets migrated over to a data analysis platform and any qualified researcher can access that data. Um, and through patient sharing preferences, we align how that gets, how that data gets shared and where. That's great. It seems like a really good step in the right direction between bringing some uniformity to everything that is out there. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about your role and how that impacts RareX's work? Yeah. So essentially, um, my role, which was created when I came on board, because you know that's the way that's the way small companies are as you grow. <laughs> so. Um, my role as Senior Director of Scientific Programs is essentially around the utilization of the data. So I um, develop both programming and really strategic collaborations to ensure that we are making the best use that we can of the data that patients and families entrust to us. So that means that um, one program, for example, that I'm um, that I'm managing uh, this year is an open science data challenge. So we have currently about 30 um, patient advocacy groups in the pediatric neurodevelopmental space. So these are all families that have children um, affected with disorders where they have like global developmental delay and seizures, but they're different, right? So they're, they're different, but similar and overlapping conditions. Um, and we are pulling that data, um, over and aligning it with, um, with some other partner data, and then making that widely available to a very large research community under a challenge environment, kind of like a hackathon, um, to try to generate some really useful insights and also to generate um, research proposals for follow-on grants. So like that's one example of how, like in my role, I'm really looking at how do we develop both the kind of partnerships for additional data sources, as well as like uses of the data that circle back and really benefit the patient community. Yeah, I think that collaboration amongst researchers and kind of challenging them in that way can kind of bring about really new change that we might not have seen in the past. It, it's always great when you get a bunch of people together and they can kind of have this back and forth and sharing of knowledge and like that challenge seems really interesting way of inspiring yeah. And you know what? It also like there are data scientists who work on these kinds of challenges who aren't the researchers that like you would normally think about. Right. They are not the academic clinical researchers or even laboratory researchers who currently work on that group of disorders. But many of them are data scientists that are sort of just broadly interested in healthcare and like the applicability of machine learning to healthcare challenges. Yeah, it's really neat how it's bringing together all those different types of people to forward a kind of more narrow mission, but affecting many different rare disease communities at the same time. Yeah, and so, so we'll be doing, we'll be doing those like now, now the plan is that we'll be doing those annually and just sort of taking on, you know, different groups each year and kind of just getting that data out there. Yeah, other than neurodevelopmental, are there any other groups that you're working with in this way? Um, well, this is our first one. So this is the first time that we've done this. And um, now our plan is to do one annually. So we haven't actually started um, planning for next year because we are deep in the planning for this year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but, you know, other groups that are currently on the platform um, include like some adult onset neurodegenerative disorders. Um, 
also, you know, some inherited retinal disorders. Uh, so, um, Usher syndrome, for example, like that community is actively collecting data um, on the platform. Uh, and then as you know, other related inherited ocular um, disorders that aren't retinal, but share a lot of overlapping kind of issues and needs um, like labor hereditary optic neuropathy. Um, mm -hmm. They're collecting data. So there are, there are these sort of, you know, groups that we could think about um, designing challenges that that sort of cover many different rare diseases instead of just one rare disease at a time. Yeah, that's really neat. Um, so I know you've been involved in the IRD space for some time now. What inspired you to join Rare X? Yeah, so I have. So I have. I mean, my career, my career as a genetic counselor really started in inherited retinal diseases. Um, I started working at the KCI Institute in 2001. Uh, and, and in that role, like it was exclusively um, inherited eye diseases, the vast majority of which are inherited retinal diseases, not all, but at most. And so um, then when I, when I, left and went to go work for informed DNA, um, you know, I was really looking at how do I take so much of what we were providing to patients and families who traveled to our center? How do I take as much as, as I can from that kind of, of experience and make it available to the patients and families who can't do that kind of travel, who aren't making it to the major academic research centers. And so making a lot of that experience available in a telemedicine environment and doing that in collaboration and partnership with their local retina specialist, right? Not totally independently, but really in collaboration and in making sure that we're communicating back and forth. And um, I don't think this was your exact question, but just like as background. So so like, I really like lived in this space of inherited retinal disease for a long time. And then as you stated, I've developed, you know, sponsored genetic testing programs in collaboration with Spark Therapeutics and collaboration with the Foundation Finding Blindness and just had really amazing, wonderful experiences with both of them as partners that really dramatically changed the landscape of who could access genetic testing just dramatically um, and just opening it up and, and getting genetic testing in the hands of so many more patients and families than had ever been able to access that before. And, um, and so that was like really exciting in that community. And then, and then at informed DNA, we realized, oh, there's a real need to do this beyond inherited retinal disease. A lot of what I had been working to help build we should just really do more broadly for rare diseases. There are so many rare disease communities that could benefit from those same kind of sponsored programs, both for genetic testing and genetic counseling. And so I was doing that for a number of years, for several years. Um, but the problem that I kept encountering was that if a, if a rare disease community didn't already have either an ongoing clinical trial or natural history study. Like there was no funder sitting there ready to fund these kind of programs. And, um, and, and I tried a lot of different ways uh, to solve this problem, but ultimately it became very difficult to solve in the environment that I was in. And then through the Usher Syndrome Coalition, actually I met uh, Rarex. I met Nicole, the founder, and um, Charlene, the CEO, and um, and I just really loved the mission that what they're doing is really enabling even the smallest patient groups to start really becoming very actively involved in clinical research, um, and like flipping flipping that paradigm where a patient community doesn't doesn't have to wait for a clinical trial or a natural history study in order for you know them to for their data to start to be really valuable but flipping that right where the the patient communities really drive the research agenda and 
begin to say like, look, we have the data and we have, you know, really started to de-risk this disease as a disease that would be valuable to pharma to invest in. So, you know, come on, <laughs> like we'll partner. And I, I just, I love that. I really, I love that paradigm shift. I loved, um, getting to be part of that. Yeah, that's a great point because, you know, one of the things we always talk about at Hope and Focus is, you know, an educated and driven patient community can really be a catalyst in accelerating treatments. And I think, you know, that kind of narrative of flipping the script and not waiting for someone else to take something on, but to, you know, take it on yourselves as a community. Um, Because, you know, even amongst LCA, all of the genes that can cause LCA, you know, have their own communities to an extent and, you know, are trying to push that narrative. So it's really nice to hear that Rare X can be a platform where that can come together. Yeah. That's great. So um, moving on to uh, the fact that Rare X has merged with Global Genes, um, what does that mean for the company and for the rare disease community? That's right. So it's kind of funny, you know, I was describing how um, we, how Nicole Boyce, the founder of Global Genes, ended up kind of striking out to, um, to, to um, found RareX later. Um, and now it's sort of bringing those back together, you know, yeah. so like she left given this recognition. So, um, you know, really coming together and joining global genes is, is kind of enabling the entire sort of journey of the patient advocate. So, um, you know, if you think about like a rare disease um, patient or parent, you know, you kind of start um, on your, on your diagnostic journey, your diagnostic odyssey, like searching for the diagnosis, right? What is wrong? Um, you get that diagnosis and maybe there's a patient um, foundation or community that already exists. Maybe there's not, if it's an ultra rare disease, right? Um, so those patients and families going through that have lots of needs. You know this, you talk to lots and lots of families through Hub and Focus, but um, you know, lots of questions and needs around like, what do I do now? And what do I do now can be like, how do I support my child best in the school system? It can be like, what do I go back and tell my, our pediatrician when we go home that, because this is so rare, like I'm sure she's never heard of it. So like, what do we tell her and, and how do we follow that? And are there things that we need to be watchful for? And, um, but beyond that, like the patient advocacy journey is something that Global Genes for a long time has really been very involved in, in supporting um, groups who decide it's time, like we need a patient foundation related to this disease, um, but we don't even know where to begin. Like, how do we even start one? And when we start one, do we need kind of scientific advisors right away or can that come later? And once we decide we need scientific advisors, like, how do we go about that? And, you know, once, once we have that in place, how do we determine a research agenda? Like we want to fund some research, but uh, like maybe I, as a parent, am interested in funding research because I happen to know a lot about it because the PI like diagnosed my child. Right. And I have a relationship there, but maybe that's not necessarily the best research for the diseases, you know, as a whole. And so Global Genes has been, has been working to support a lot of those steps of the patient advocacy journey. RareX has been developing this platform and developing these partnerships to use this data. And it's really just like, it's an extension of that, of that patient advocate journey. And so much of, of what um, both Global Genes and RareX have been doing is related to how do we both educate and support patient advocates in becoming more active participants in research and helping to drive that research agenda? And, um, and so there, I think there were, there's a lot of overlap that was beginning to really develop there that just makes sense. 
Yeah. I mean, I think that with patient advocacy, um, most foundations are started out of need and, you know, they're often started by parents or those that are living with um, diseases. So it is inherently something that needs a lot of guidance and a lot of help and pushing in the right direction. And especially when it comes to a research standpoint, um, a lot of education around how best to go about that. So I think the services that are provided are very straightforward and needed for our community. So, so specifically within the IRD community, um, is there are there things that Rare X is working on that can impact the IRD community? Yes. So um, right now we, uh, it's a sort of two things. So right now on the Rare X platform, on the data collection platform, there are currently those two groups um, that I mentioned earlier actively collecting data. So the Usher Syndrome Coalition um, and actually a couple of other related patient advocacy groups in Usher Syndrome, they're actively collecting data. And similarly, the Labor Hereditary Optic Neuropathy Group is actively collecting data. Um, on that platform. But meanwhile, and you know this well, um, Courtney, we, um, I am co-leading an initiative called the Vision Consortium through RareX. And our goal with the Vision Consortium is to bring together various patient groups in inherited eye disease, which would include inherited retinal disease, but also inherited optic nerve disorders. So to bring these groups together and to utilize that kind of shared community for a couple of purposes. Um, one is to uh, develop kind of shared goals and projects that will really benefit everybody. That doesn't, it just doesn't make a lot of sense for everybody to be doing these independently, right? So when, you know, as an example, um, one of the very first projects that we um, want to take on and we're current, we're in the planning stages for now is um, the digitization of um, OCT data. So like virtually everybody who listens to this, you know, if they're the one affected or their child is the one affected at some point, they've had an OCT, probably they've had many. Um, and those images are... Uh, are proprietary to the software and the hardware that was used. So there are lots of different companies that make OCTs. Yeah. yeah. There are lots of different companies that make OCTs. And within a given institution, if they're running a natural history study or a clinical trial, they of course will make sure that every single patient gets tested using the same equipment and the same version so that they're comparable. Mm -hmm. Right. But that is far from true when you think about the way that OCTs are used broadly everywhere. It's like different centers may use different equipment. They may use different versions. Um, and then that means that those images aren't directly comparable to each other. And so we're actually working with a, um, an AI group that has developed ways to bring all that data together and make it cross comparative. So to bring these different images together, to align them in such a way that we can pull out data points from them that are directly comparable one to another, and then to make all of that data widely available to the research community and put them to work on it. So like, this is not something that, um, you know, so the RDH 12 group, which is obviously a group within the LCA spectrum, um, they were the initial leaders of, of this project, and now there are multiple other groups joining in. But like, this would be an extraordinarily difficult thing for them to do entirely on their own. Yeah. But it has so much overlap with all of the inherited retinal disorders and even the optic nerve disorders because that OCT image captures, you know, um, it depending upon um, the type of OCT that's done, right, it can capture all of those different tissues. So this is like a perfect example of a project where like combining resources makes it possible to do bigger, bolder projects than we could do individually. Um, and then we also 
want to start collecting patient reported outcome data, uh, which the FDA is increasingly asking for. They're not just accepting, they're asking for this data. Like we want to know how this disease, how these diseases impact patients. And we want to use that in clinical trials. So, you know, there's been a lot of work done um, by a number of different groups. The Foundation Fighting Blindness has done some of this work. The University of Michigan has done some of this work in really developing kind of better patient reported outcome um, measures. And we're going to be looking at implementing some of those directly onto the RareX platform so that when patients and families come and they're, they're entering data on the platform, they're entering this, these, they're answering these, these highly structured surveys that, you know, the FDA has said that it will accept so that we start to collect this data longitudinally and have that available. And, and we have it available, not just in the patients who can travel to those big academic research centers. Yeah. So what does some of that data collection look like for those who are in the IRD community that may have gotten genetic testing already um, and have kind of gone through that part of the process? Um, is it kind of follow-up data collection? Is there a way to integrate some of that data? What does that side of things look like? Absolutely. So when um, when someone first comes on to the RareX platform and they start entering data, it will ask them for their, their self-reported um, diagnosis, right? So what's the diagnosis that you've been given? Do you have a genetic um, test result? Like has genetic testing been done and do you have a genetic test result? Um, it asks about symptoms and sort of the, the progression of those symptoms over time. Um, but for the genetic testing data, we actually have people just upload a copy of their genetic test results. And then we have a genetic curation team that um, reviews those, pulls out that data and makes sure that that data is in um, discrete data points that's really, really useful to researchers. Because uh, a researcher coming onto the platform does not want to pour through a whole bunch of PDFs and, and sometimes frankly, like pictures from somebody's phone of their test yeah. results, right? So like we curate all of that data and make sure that that's available on the research portal. Great. I'm um, going to take a couple of questions that have come in just because they're relevant to what we're talking about right now. So the first one is asking if the LCA community is on the RareX data collecting platform. Yeah. So um, not right now. So we are, I mean, RareX is, I, I should say, is pretty young. So the platform has been live for about a year and a half. And we are very, very much building this plane as we fly it. And what I mean by that is that we don't have like all of the surveys, all of the patient reported outcome measures that we eventually want to have on the, on the platform currently implemented. So part of what the vision consortium is doing is saying like, what are all those things that we need? Right. What, what are all the things that we want to make sure that we have on the platform and how do we make sure that they're implemented in a way that really breaks down barriers that are, that are often inherent to having a visual impairment, mm -hmm. right? Less concerning if you're the parent of a child affected because most of the parents are unaffected, um, but we want it to be accessible to everybody. So we're, we're, we're doing that work in the vision consortium to ensure that we're adding the right kinds of surveys and surveys and patient reported outcome measures to the platform that are most useful to this patient community, um, to this broad patient community. Um, and then, you know, at that point, you know, we'll continue to talk with Hope and Focus, with other groups. Um, there are, of course, some individual groups within the LCA, like broader family of diseases, um, that have their own foundations and some of them are, are actively participating in the vision consortium. So RDH 12 is one of those that I already mentioned. CRB one is one of those. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think really, as soon as we start to have some of those more vision specific surveys, both of them intend to, to come on and start collecting data pretty actively. Yeah. 
And then um, as a follow up to that um, is the genetic testing and counseling community. Um, are you working with them to make sure they have an awareness of the platform um, so that when they're diagnosed or their caregivers can participate? Yeah, that's a really great question. So um, I think right now it would be a little bit premature just because we haven't built some of some of what we really <laughs> ideally want for this community onto the platform and we're actively working on that. Um, it's important to note that this is like patient driven data. So when we start to work with some of those um, genetic testing and genetic counseling providers, it will be more about like getting the word out about what we're doing and, and you know, and, and giving that to families as a resource, as opposed to enrolling families like on their behalf or sending mm -hmm. us genetic test reports directly. Um, like the, you know, the kind of whole like theory, philosophy, I guess, behind the platform is the value of patient-driven participation in data. Great. Um, another question just popped in while we were talking. Um, so uh, on behalf of Rare X, what did the organization bring to the table at last fall's RDH12 scientific conference um, dealing with that form of LCA? Yeah, so, I mean, I, I will say that my primary role in attending the RDH12 um, meeting last fall in Baltimore was to listen and learn. Like, honestly, I mean, I've been working in this community for 21 years, um, but really listening to what are some of the successes and failures related to the ongoing natural history studies related to um, clinical trials in LCA that have been done. You know, Wiley Chambers from the FDA was sitting like two people down from me in this room. And um, Jane, gosh, I just forgot her last name. Anyway, from the EMA, from the European mm -hmm. yeah. um, you know, medicines agency, like she was um, online and joining us. And so it was incredibly valuable to listen to their perspectives about what are really, what do they see as both the value and the challenges in patient reported outcome data and other types of data as we think about clinical outcomes you know, in clinical trials. So like, what are the outcome measures that we're gonna, that that we plan to use? And does that align with what the FDA um, will accept? Courtney? Yeah. Oh, I'm you froze on your I'm so sorry that I am frozen, but I hope you can hear me. And I'm, here I am, I'm back. Okay. Um, <laughs> So thank you for answering the question. Um, and I think I'll just end with um, my last prepared question is kind of just, you know, where do you see Rare X going in the next five years? I know we've talked a lot about how you're kind of in very early stages. There's a lot of exciting things on the horizon. Um, you know, what's next? Yeah, I think there are several things that are next. Um, but biggest picture, you know, really big picture, I think um, there are probably some people who saw the very, very recent um, uh, announcement and approval of um, a new uh, rare disease therapy. So there was a therapy just, just recently within the last um, two days uh, approved for a disorder called Friedrich's ataxia. Mm -hmm. And um, which is rare neuro neurologic disorder, um, typically uh, gets diagnosed in sort of, you know, mid childhood um, to early adolescence, um, really severe disorder. So what's really interesting about this approval is that for the first time ever, the FDA said that this approval, which initially they had some, they had, they had some concerns about the data and like, did the data really prove that this therapy was effective? Mm -hmm. And they didn't feel that the data from the clinical trial um, was sufficient. 
Um, and that is in a rare disease that can be a tremendous blow. Like, do we really have to go and do another clinical trial when this one lasted years yeah. and it required patients from all over the world to travel to clinical trial sites? Like that is crushing to think you might have to do another one, even when everybody believes it worked. Right. Yeah. And what they were able to do is they were able to actually provide to the FDA um, data from an ongoing natural history study that they were doing as essentially a control arm to mm -hmm. say like, okay, here's what happens to patients with this disease, not on treatment. And here's what happened in our study on treatment. So like, no, we did not do a long, like a, a years long placebo controlled trial, right? They did a crossover where there was a short period of time in, in some of the patients off therapy, and then they crossed over to therapy, but they could say like, yeah, but over the entire length of this clinical trial, if you compare all of those patients, the original set and the crossover set to the untreated patients in the natural history study, it's fair. There's a very clear difference. And for the first time ever, the FDA accepted that. And it has really brought up a lot of excitement and a lot of questions around like, patient generated data because the patient community drove that natural history study. They started it, they funded it, they got the word out about it. Where, where Rare X and Global Genes ha has an opportunity to be really part of, of this story and part of the evolution, like the continued evolution of this is to say, well, to what extent can we include patient data that is collected remotely? It isn't all like we don't have to have hundreds of patients traveling to one of two, you know, natural history sites. Yeah. But rather, we can take data that is collected by like their local physician, image data that we'll be able to, right, compare with AI, <laughs> with AI. And then the patient reported outcome data that's being collected like really systematically on the platform. So to what extent can we take that data? Now, I am not suggesting that clinical data and like traditional natural history studies are going to be replaced. Mm -hmm. No way. Like there's so much value in those studies, so much value. But we also know that that only ever captures like a small percentage of the patient community who can travel. So how can we really make that kind of research more broadly available to a much larger population of patients and to find something that's a little bit more hybrid, right? Yeah. That um, in, in any way, I think that that is a huge part of where I see us going in the next five years is how do we work together with the patient advocacy groups that we support to develop some of these hybrid approaches to data collection that are much more inclusive? Yeah, that's the word that kind of kept ringing through my head as you spoke to that is, you know, the inclusion and, you know, breaking down those barriers of people's access to be able to have this reported data, as well as, you know, the nature of IRDs being degenerative. Um, you can't always see that clearly in a year. Um, and, you know, you kind of need these longer range studies and, you know, reported outcomes in order to be able to really capture what does the degeneration look like? And, you know, how does a treatment work against that? So I do think that that approval was a huge turning point for our community. And it'll be really interesting to see what comes next. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Carmen. I have really appreciated our conversation. And I hope that um, everyone who is watching this later will get to enjoy some of that as well. And we'll go and follow you guys and your efforts with, through Global Genes and Rare X. And we have much more partnership to come and hopefully more things to announce over the years. Sounds great. Thanks so much. Thanks. Have a great day. You too.